China have landed on the moon. So, in this week's podcast, we're going to be looking back at the most significant robotic moon missions. And of course, the space news continues to come in thick and fast, so we'll round up all the latest stories from the past. And I know what you're thinking, social media. Yes, we're on that too. Come and follow us at Space and Things One on Twitter or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And if you can, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. But right now, it's time for episode 14 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 14 of our podcast. How have you been, Emily? It's Thanksgiving weekend, right, for you guys? So it's pretty crazy in America, right? Yeah, we had a long weekend where I'm at. And it was it was pretty nice. I didn't I mean, I can't say I did much. Most of the time I just caught up on napping, which was really nice. Oh, and always um, good. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. Uh I you know, but yeah, it was a nice weekend, just very relaxing and I just pretty much just tried to take it easy. So what what's up with you? Uh busy busy doing music stuff, which is good. Um I've discovered a website called Twitch. I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, uh, I've it's, heard of yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's traditionally a gaming thing, but a lot of musicians have been getting on there recently, and I've been delving into that world and doing some streams on there. And I also produced a Christmas EP this week for my friend Gary, who's a, who's a singer. And uh, and that's been a lot of fun as well. So that came out this week. So it's all it's all been happening. It's all, it's all happening, but... All good stuff. It feels nice to be a musician again, that's for sure. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is my job, after all. <laughs> no, I understand. It's, but, uh, it's especially with this pandemic. It, I know, you know, it's been very difficult for artists and of of all, you know, musicians, what have you. So, yeah, that's great news. Yeah, it's it's a nice feeling being back, that's for sure. Uh, but anyway, enough about us. Shall we? Uh, <laughs> should, should we get on yeah, with the show? Yeah, let's go. Ron, you're not gonna believe this. It looks. Uh... It's safe to say that it was all happening for SpaceX last Tuesday night after we finished recording episode 13. The Starship SN8 performed a big static fire test at their Boca Chica base in Texas, which paves the way for the 15-kilometer launch and land attempt of the rocket, which should hopefully be happening this week. Starship is an exciting rocket straight from a sci-fi book uh, and is looking to almost revolutionize spaceflight. Um, and this test happened almost immediately before SpaceX completed their 100th successful launch of the Falcon 9 rocket, which has also been a game-changing rocket. So good work, SpaceX, with that. They put another 60 Starlink satellites into space, uh, and this mission was also the first time they've reused the first stage seven times. And I'm still not bored of watching that thing land. Absolutely. On Sunday, November 29th, uh, the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries of Japan launched an H-2A rocket to deploy a top-secret communication satellite from the uh, Tenge... <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> uh, Tanegashima. thank you. Oh, my God. We'll go oh, my that. God. Oh, my God. Io, Fio, Fifi, Fofum. I was like, I thought I was like Finnish <laughs> or something like that. I am so sorry to everybody <laughs> in Japan, by the way. I, I love the Japanese space agency. I, I love you guys. I saw that word and I almost started crying. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it is, it's an imposing word, oh that's for God. sure. <laughs> okay. The Space Center. Uh, <laughs> this is the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a failure. Okay. This is the fourth launch from Japan this year, and it looks like to be the last of this year, but with Japanese astronaut uh, Soichi Noguchi aboard the International Space Station, uh, Japan have certainly had a strong orbital presence in 2020. Good good work there. <laughs> it has been noted yes. that I do tend to give you the the, uh, the bits of news that have words which are hard to pronounce, <laughs> so... Um... Yeah, I I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> it was okay. I was not. Ex I was like, oh my god, I got ambushed by that one. That one. <laughs> that one just snuck up and hit me. Like, oh my god, it's okay. I, 
Tanagashima. I think Tanagashima. that's how you say it. Okay, now I got it. Yeah, and I'd like to apologize to right, everybody yeah. in Japan ever for doing for ruining <laughs> your language. Uh, I love you guys, and I did not mean to do that. I am so sorry. I've now got a nice easy bit of news to, to okay. talk about. So if I get any of these words wrong, it's because I am a, a, the ultimate failure. But anyway, at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, yes, the first piece of the Space Launch System, or the SLS rocket, has been stacked in preparation for Artemis 1, uh, which should launch next year. However, due to a problem with the power unit in the Orion spacecraft, which will sit on top of that rocket, this mission could now suffer even more delays. Uh, there are currently a lot of people looking at the administration changes and worrying about whether the Artemis program and the SLS will survive. And this news won't alleviate those worries, but hopefully this program will stay in place. I know it has got a lot of us excited, but that news is um is it's definitely not good. It's you know, to take that long and having to change a power supply essentially um, is pretty crazy, but it just shows how complex these spacecraft are. Yeah, I was um, I was assuming, and obviously I was wrong, I, I was assuming that they could easily switch, you know, something like that out, but uh, I guess I was <laughs> incorrect. So we'll see. I don't know. That's that it is kind of scary. Not, not scary, but just like, I don't know. I'm not happy about it. <laughs> certainly, yeah. Certainly, uh, to yeah, say yeah. the least. It's, it's, it's it was one of the redundancies, wasn't it? It was the I think so. the backup power supply basically is it just just failed. So obviously, it would still work, but if the main one goes, yeah, and the it and it kind of shows you like the space shuttle, um, which is I guess Orion's predecessor, was a lot different. It had a uh, a ton of redundancies built into it. Like, I think the computers on the shuttle were, like, quadruple redundant or something, just in case, you know, God forbid one of them or a few of them fail, you got a backup, you know, so. Was it was it the anniversary of STS-9 this week where yes. didn't John Young have to deal with a load of failures and they had to stay up a bit longer or do a couple of orbits? Yeah, I think they had some GPCs, general purpose computer failures, and then, uh, oh, my God, the end of the mission uh, when... <laughs> John was flying an on on fire space shuttle. So yeah. Oh yeah, there was a leak, wasn't there? That of, yeah. Of yeah, the, one of Crazy the stuff. I think that one of the APUs was on fire, and they didn't know about it until they landed. Yeah. You know, and yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, and that was how John Young ended his flying career. So uh, flying an <laughs> on fire space shuttle. I mean, it it is like the most John Young ending to anything. So yeah, <laughs> and he was just cool about it. Probably like yeah, whatever, you know. Um, unfortunately, we got some more bad news. Um, yeah. after we, okay, as you may remember last week, we talked about the, uh, Arecibo Observatory, uh, in Puerto Rico being shut down. Well, it appears that the 900 ton instrument platform, uh, collapsed this morning into the, uh, reflector dish, which it was 450 feet below. Thankfully, no one was hurt but this definitely marks the end of the observatory. So it had a 57-year yeah. run, and today it came to its end, which is very sad. Yeah, those images are really sad that have come out from that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, really really sad news. Very sad news, but at least no one was, no one was hurt, that's for sure. Um, right, after giving you a load of grief for your pronunciation, <laughs> uh, I've given myself one challenge uh, this week. So, um, but but it does mean we end this week's news segment on some good news. And last week we mentioned the launch from China of the Chang'e Five <laughs> mission to the moon. I have no idea if I've said that correctly. Anyway, uh, this morning it landed, and this was the third successful landing uh, on the moon by China. And oddly enough, on the seventh anniversary of the launch of China's first moon landing mission. Um, it's, it was all a bit of a drama online, though. If you were following this, you might have known. But uh, the live feed was suddenly pulled, and uh, then no one really knew what was happening. And then some amateur radio people started tweeting, saying that they were receiving a signal from it. And then eventually Chinese news outlets reported the news that had, saved it, uh, had a so safe, soft landing. Um, so, it was, yeah, it was, it's a bit crazy. I can't imagine... like. NASA being no, like that, they, and it's one of the things you have to be grateful with for NASA for is they they are so open with everything and and and, and share everything as it happens, good and bad. Oh yeah, uh, but there was there was some certainly some doubts uh, as to what was going on. 
uh, this morning. Uh, and of course, it's Tuesday today as we record this, uh, Tuesday the 1st of December. Um, but the plan plan for this mission uh, is to package about two kilograms, or for my US friends, that's about four and a half pounds of lunar samples and bring them back to Earth. Uh, and this is about 10 times the amount which was brought back to the Earth on the last such mission, which was by the Soviet Union, their Lunar 24 mission 44 years ago. Um, so that's uh, it, it all looks like good news from on that front. They've, they've done the landing, which I think is probably the hardest part of that mission. Yeah. Certainly as we, as we go ahead into the next segment, we'll talk a lot about how difficult it actually is to land on the moon. Yeah, and how many... Uh... And some uh, moon missions that went uh, kind of wrong <laughs> before we got them right. Yeah, I'm really happy for the uh, Chinese people. I, I know, um, obviously, my country and uh, China are not on great terms, but uh, I do support their space endeavors, and I think that's pretty awesome. I'm really enjoying following what they're doing right now. I try to view, you know, this victory for humanity, and I try not to view things as like for one specific country you know i think it's awesome that we, we're gonna get a sample return you know a sample return mission you know and it's been this long i mean 44 years that's a that's a that's a ways that that was a minute ago you know that was a that was a while back yeah, yeah. that's older than me and i'm old as dirt so yeah that that's a while <laughs> that's a while ago so um yeah so i'm really happy that somebody is doing somebody is following that up and somebody is at least going there you know um I'm hoping, I'm hoping and praying we return, you know, with Artemis and eventually. But it's neat to see, you know, just somebody doing well at it. And and, if, and it's the, yeah, the fact they've had the three missions now as well, and and there's the second of which, uh, two years ago, landed on the far side of the moon. That was the first time we've landed on the far side of the moon. So China are trying to push some boundaries out there as well, which is uh, up there, out there, up there. Yes. So, or sort of same. But yeah, it's it's good to see that that someone's doing that and, and doing it well. Three three successful landings now in the seven years. Anyway, yeah, I'm gonna play a sting and then we'll talk more about that. All right. <laughs> hey, it's your right flat, John. Wow, there's that ridge to the north. Yep, sure is. All we gotta do is jump out the hatch and we got plenty of rock. So yes, with that landing on the moon this morning, Emily and I have have been tentatively looking up some other key moments in the exploration of the moon. Uh, obviously, everyone knows about the Apollo program, which sent crews from the moon from 68 to 1972. Um, but often it's the robotic missions that are, are overlooked. Uh, so we're going to kind of just give a few a shout out uh, and, and hopefully make you want to go and find out some more uh, about what happened up there before the Apollo program and since. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's hard to know where to, to begin, but actually, they, they tried quite earlier. As soon as as soon as we got out, as soon as Sputnik happened, we were trying to get things further, uh, and to the moon was of the logical target for that. And the, and the Russians were definitely ahead on this. Uh, the Soviets were definitely ahead. Yeah, and the moon really in the United States, the moon was was a target for us. There's like a show on Disney Plus. It was from 1955, and it's a uh, Walt Disney hosts it. But there's a uh, a great many uh, interesting figures on the show, including Von Braun. I think it's called Man in Space, but they talk quite a bit about, you know, what it's going to take to get people on the moon. And this is like about 14 years before Apollo 11. So that's kind of yeah. a neat thing to view because you realize pretty early that, OK, you know, the moon was really sort of in our sight, something we were focusing on, you know, even as early as that. Like, OK, maybe we can get there at some point. It's yeah. kind of neat to watch that and see, you know, the early ideas about going to the moon. And they're a little fantastic, but they're it's fun to watch just because, you know, of all the little, you know, old school rockets. They look like, you know, it looks like the emojis on your phone, sort of the early vision of what rockets <laughs> look like and what space missions were going to be. So it's kind of neat. I've been working through this list, right, that which Emily sent me, and I'm trying to trying to find the, the first of various things. But uh, on, on the 2nd of January in 1959, the Soviets launched Mekta on a lunar rocket, and it was uh, it was supposed to impact the moon. That was the plan. Uh, but, but there was a problem with the telemetry of that rocket, and it missed 
by 3,725 miles. But that was the first mission that got anywhere near the moon. And that was 1959. I mean, that, that's before uh, any humans were in space by that point. And it only took them until September the 12th of that year where they launched Luna 2, which became the first spacecraft to reach the, uh, to reach the lunar surface. And it was a, an impact mission. Um, and so, so yeah, it was, it was only a short amount of time for them to correct that, that problem and actually do it again, 59, 10 years before that, that, um, that moon landing, which is, uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And that Russian lunar program was actually quite, un- is very underrated. It started back in that first mission, as we talked about in January, 1959 and went right the way through to 1976 with Luna 24. Uh, and it had quite a lot of different robotic missions and features a hell of a lot of space firsts. For example, on October 4th, 1959, uh the Soviets sent up the uh they flew the Luna 3 mission uh which sent back the first images from the far side of the moon. If you watch the uh the right stuff, the TV series uh and just uh saying if you haven't listened to it already, we did interview uh hot Chris Kraft last week, Eric Ladin, <laughs> so go back and listen to that. <laughs> Uh, it did. Uh, they do depict that on the right stuff as like, oh crap, you know the the Soviets are ahead of us. You know they're getting pictures from the moon. So that was kind of a. At the time, it was like you know the Americans were a little threatened by this, and you know it showed that yeah. they were a little ahead of us. So, yeah. Um, and, and in fairness, it wasn't. It, it wasn't until January 1964 uh, or February 1964 it launched at the end of January. Uh, when Americans even got to the moon uh, with with Ranger Six, uh, and, and that um, that mission was a, was an impact, uh, another one of the impact mission, uh, and it, it it did exactly that, but it failed to return any images because of a a, a power problem. Um, but yes, yeah, five years later or four and a half years later, uh, that America finally caught up and got something to to the moon. Yeah, if you read the. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Wikipedia, or I, I know uh, I shouldn't recommend Wikipedia, but its moon mission articles are not really that horrible. If you read the Ranger article, uh, you're gonna you're gonna die because there are so many failures. It really shows you how much we had to like, oh my god, you know how we how much we had to work to really get the game right to go to the moon, and how much we just didn't know back then. Because um, if you read the article, yeah. Ranger one and two. Uh, failed they were both launch failures so they didn't even make it uh off the earth much less to the moon uh rangers uh three four and five uh they all had spacecraft failures uh so either they missed the moon uh either it missed the moon or it just didn't work so and ranger six the one we talked about uh it did make it but the cameras failed so we didn't get any pictures <laughs> yeah. so that's yeah but at least it made it though right but but it is crazy. That was sixty four. Took three years. Yeah, because Rangers started in sixty one. I want to say I was yeah. reading a book. I think it's one of Jay Gallantine's book, and it discusses Ranger and how unsuccessful it was. And uh, I forgot what magazine had this headline. It could have been Av Week, but I, I might be wrong. But it had a headline like Ranger a hundred percent failure, and I'm like, oh my god. That's harsh. Yeah. But the last four missions did have success. Uh, even though six didn't take uh, photos, seven, eight, and nines uh, actually uh, impacted the moon. And uh, there's some good uh, pictures. If you go on YouTube, you can actually see they sort of mosaic or um, or stitch the photos together. And it uh, kind of has like an impact movie of what it looked like. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's still worth watching. So it's kind of interesting. But. Ranger really was, uh, Ranger and Surveyor were really the two big predecessors to Apollo, to getting humans on the moon and kind of figuring out what the, okay, what's the geology like? Is when, you know, is something going to sink into the moon when it lands? Mm, <laughs> you know, we they yeah. just didn't know, you know? So it's it's really notable to mention, you know, I think that, you know, those were really kind of the, you know, ancestors to what, you know, humans you know, landing on the moon and walking on the moon just to figure out, okay, what is the surface like? What conditions can we expect to see on here? 
But once again, it was the Soviets who landed first yeah. in February 1966 with the Lunar 9 mission successfully landing on the Correct. moon. And weirdly, that happened a few months before the first spacecraft to orbit the moon. I always assumed that the orbit happened first, but no, the first orbit happened a few months later, early in April 1966, with the Lunar 10 mission. Um, and bearing in mind the pressure on NASA to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, this must have been quite worrying to them. Uh, and I'm sure it must have felt like they were never going to catch up with the Soviets. But then I suppose they had closed the gap significantly because that was a five-year gap between the first successful missions to the moon of each country, but only a two-month gap between their first landings. And uh, as Emily mentioned earlier, the Surveyor Program, which replaced the Ranger Program for, for NASA, um, successfully landed Surveyor 1 on the moon at the start of June 66, so just a couple months later. And then in August of 66, the Americans launched Lunar Orbiter 1, uh, which sent back the first photo of the Earth from the Moon, two years before the famous Earthrise photo from Apollo 8. And there's a lot of parallels between those photos. Yeah. Um, so maybe 1966 was the real turning point in America in terms of, OK, we're there now, we've caught up with you. Yeah, and if you actually go Google the uh, the picture from Lunar Orbiter from that time, they uh, a few years ago, a group of people uh, started kind of reprocessing the data and the images from Lunar Orbiter because the originals were kind of not really high resolution. So some people cleaned them up and they're really quite beautiful and very impactful. Yeah, and Lunar Orbiter, I forgot to mention, is another one along with Surveyor and Ranger that really helped, you know, pave the way for Apollo. Uh, Lunar Orbiter was responsible for mapping a lot of the moon and figuring out, you know, some of the surfaces there and a lot of the pictures that we got from that um, were used during Apollo to, you know, show astronauts, okay, this is what the terrain is going to look like. This is what you're going to approach when you're landing. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool. I mean, just think about it. You know, I, I try to put myself in that situation or that mind frame, like, okay, I'm going to fly to the moon. This is the <laughs> expected area. This is the terrain of where I'm going. Like, can you imagine? I cannot wrap my head around that at all. I know they were professionals and obviously they had to be focused, but there's, there's that part of me that would be like, holy crap, I'm really doing this. You know, that's insane. Actually, I, I just, that's a really good thing. I was looking at the moon this week because it was a beautiful full moon this yes. week. I don't know if you saw it. Was it was gorgeous. It was so stunning. And I, I did catch myself as I as I often do looking up and, and thinking about it. And I was just looking at it thinking, I've seen photos of you up close and you look nothing like what I'm looking at now. It's cra it, it that it just blows your mind, doesn't it? Every time you look up there, like people have walked on that, and and we've got spaceships on there, and and, and space like it's it's just crazy. Yeah, like it's it's that little thing in the sky, and and it's miles away. But anyway, yeah, I, I digress there. <laughs> no, it's okay. I do the same thing. I I look up, and I'm just kind of like there's spacecraft up there. There, I have friends who've been up there. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're talking to them, and they're just like, hey, how you doing? And then it's like. Dude, they've been to the freaking moon. Like, it just kind of hits moon. you. Like, what? Yeah, they're just eating, you know, nacho chips. Like, yeah, I went to the moon, you know? And you're like, wait a second. Yeah, I don't know. It's just something I think about. I don't know. There's some astronauts. You, the first time you meet them, you think of, like, their big moment, I guess. Like, their big photo moment. And I remember, you yeah. know, when I, um, I had the opportunity to meet Gene Cernan a few times. And I just kept thinking about, like, you know, Apollo 17 and those pictures. And he's just... He was a no just this normal guy asking me, like, what the hell is a blog? And I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> he's just a regular dude, you know? OK, I got really off track, but go on. Let's let's go back. We're still talking about the moon. It's yeah, all good. It's all Gene Cernan was there. But he wasn't being rude, by yeah, the way. He was. That's just how he talked. He he had no idea what the hell a space blog was. None. Why, why would he? It, he was like, why in his, would he? he was almost 80. Why would he? No, yeah, exactly. exactly. I wasn't offended. I almost it, died laughing because I was like, oh. Anyway, back to the uh, robotic missions. In the mid '60s, uh, there was still a race going on to get a human on the moon, and the Soviets were doing everything behind closed doors. But America were also very active to what they were doing, and the Apollo 8 mission, which was the first crewed mission to the moon in December '68, happened because of the progress of the Soviet Zonda program. And it was on board Zond 5 where life forms from Earth were first sent to the moon. Um, and 
it was also the first mission to successfully return a spacecraft from the moon. I'm pretty sure they were turtles or tortoises. Tortoises, anyway, yeah, yeah, tortoises. Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, that mission took place in September 1968, uh, and the knowledge of it definitely forced America to change that Apollo 8 mission from being a low Earth orbit mission to a crewed lunar orbit mission because they were concerned that Russian had the capability to send uh, a crew around the moon. Yeah. However, the Soviets did know they had problems with this program. And although they had the realization they meant land a human on the moon uh, before the Americans, they could potentially still get some first achieves like that orbital flight, which didn't happen. Uh, and one of the other things that they tried to do was to bring a sample back from the moon before the Americans. And uh, they cut it really fine in their attempt to do so, with uh, a mission launching just three days before Apollo 11 uh, to try and bring back that sample from the moon. It reached orbit on the 17th of July, two days before uh, Apollo 11 arrived at the moon, but it didn't actually attempt a landing until after the Apollo 11 landing, and it also crashed. Uh, so this is one of those stories that doesn't get spoken about very much, but it adds so much drama to the Apollo 11 story. I think it was Luna 15. That was the one. It was 15, yeah. And, um, it was 15. Uh, Jay Galantine, again, he did a an, an, <laughs> an incredible talk last year about that mission at Space Fest. I mean, it was, like, incredible. Because at first I was like, man, Luna 15, this is going to be kind of boring. Okay, it went up there and crashed, whatever. The end. No, this yeah. talk was incredible. Like, uh, we found out that the, the Soviets were sending up a sample return mission and the concern was like, are, what are what radio frequencies are they using? Is it going to interfere with interfere with Apollo Eleven? In oh, what orbit is this in? Like, is this going to be in the same orbit? Like, what's going on? Basically, what happened was um, after Apollo Eight, astronaut Frank Borman, who commanded Apollo Eight, um, he actually went on a tour of the Soviet Union. Um, he actually forged a pretty decent relationship with a lot of the Russians over there. So what happened was, um, <laughs> this is the way Jay Galantine tells the story, but he did a, obviously he's done a lot of research on this. And um, if you buy his book, Infinity Beckoned, uh, you can read a lot of this in there. It's amazing. But uh, Chris Kraft found out about Luna 15 and was like, oh my God, you know, What's going on? Are they using the, you know, he was freaking out. So he calls Frank Borman and he's like, look, I need you to do something about this because, you know, we don't know what frequencies they're using. We don't know where they're at. You know, we don't, we don't know what's going on. So Frank was like, okay, just give me a second, you know, and I'll, I'll do something <laughs> about it. So he gets off the phone, you know, and he's like, dang it. You know, so he, I, um, I want to say, called either he i forgot if he called somebody or sent like a telegram or something to somebody and was like hey you know could you tell me a little bit about what's up with luna 15 you know we've got you know three guys going to the moon and um we just want to make sure you know they're not you know kind of interfering with us or anything uh can you help and for the first time in space history the soviets actually cooperated with us and they wow. were like yeah, for the first time, they basically sent a message back like they're on this frequency, um, which was not going to interfere with us. And it's in this orbit. It's not going to interfere with you. And um, everything should be fine for you guys. Even though the mission failed, it was actually the start of of space diplomacy in, in many, many ways. It was. Yeah, it was kind of a, a, a it was definitely a first in space history in that the Soviets and us started to cooperate better together because you know there was some reach outreach between our people and their people so that was definitely yeah. a first up uh, so the story is really actually pretty cool it's if you get infinity beckoned i highly recommend it uh you need to get seriously if none of y'all have his books already you need to buy both of jay gallantine's books um, he's got okay. two of them. He's got um, Ambassadors from Earth, and he's got Infinity Beckon. I will put links in in the show notes okay. to those to those books. <laughs> I'm getting a little off topic, but Ambassadors is more about um, outer solar syst system exploration, and um, Infinity Beckon is about inner solar system, including the moon. And you, okay. everybody needs to read it. It's excellent. But um, it really goes into Luna 15 and how it was like. You know, we were sort of panicking at first because we're like, "Oh my God, they're going the same." <laughs> 
time we are. You know, like, what the heck? When you break it down, though, the moon is so big. The chances of them being the same are so, so slim. Yeah. I understand the radio frequency thing. Even then, there's chances of them using the same as slim. But, but yeah, it's still amusing that, that NASA were worried about this this other probe. Obviously, the speeds they're traveling at, if there would have been any kind of collision, that would have been catastrophic. But yeah. so, so slim, so slim that that could have happened. But Yeah, and but it does show that the Soviets were trying to do a last-minute like a last ditch effort to not outdo us, but get attention. Like it's like get a first, get some kind of first. Like it's kind of like if you show up at a party, you know, and you're wearing a dress and somebody comes up with like, comes to the party with the amped up version of the dress. And it's like all sequined (laughs) and they're like, gotcha. It's sort of like that. So, yeah, but they did, they did eventually get their own sample only a year later, Luna 16, uh, on the 12th of September launched uh, of 1970. And uh, that was the first robotic sample um, ever ever returned. Amer- America never did robotic samples because obviously they had humans to do it. Yes. Um, but uh, there was a number of missions between September 1970 and August 1976, which was Luna 24 uh, for, for the Soviets that all brought back um, some samples so they got they got a fair amount um, and then after that there's a gap there is a gap uh, there was one there was one flyby of the moon uh, on on route somewhere else to get some gla- uh, gravitational um, help to get a boost uh, but it wasn't a boost yeah but it wasn't until um, Japan uh, got involved with the the I think it's the hit and fly by orbital mission, which was in January 1990. A whole 14 years passed before someone wanted to go back to the moon again, which which blows my mind. The success, like when you think of how many things happened in between 1959 and those early 70s missions, to then there be that much of a gap. I think the reason for such a big gap, honestly, was probably for a few reasons. Um, or obviously we explored the moon during Apollo pretty extensive or not extensively, but we got a lot of samples and the moon was mapped pretty extensively. Um, another thing is that um, the moon is observable from the ground. So I'm sure that yeah. also there were probably astronomers who were observing it, you know, and um, even though you can't see certain aspects of the moon from here, um, they probably figured, you know, well, we'll just, you know, use, I, I don't think it was a priority during that time. Yeah. I noticed like, if you look at the history of like, uh, lunar and interplanetary missions, you can tell there are certain points where like certain planets are real popular and then it just kind of goes away because people are kind of like, well, it's kind of risky to go there or we can look at it from here. You know, yeah, and and I guess when you've when you've just collected a lot of data about a certain place, you've got enough to pour over and to learn from. I guess that all does make a lot of sense. Um, but s- since two thousand and three. Uh, We've seen orbital and flyby missions from the European Space Agency, from Japan, from Lux Space. And uh, and also we had some failed landing attempts by India and Israel just last year. Um, So it does appear to be the place. uh, My printer's just decided to turn on. (laughs) And uh, scared the life out of me for a moment. I was like, "What? What was that? What was that?" I've got my headphones on. I was like, "What's what's what's going on in here?" <laughs> Talking about robotics, and suddenly something like you're like, "Yeah." So so yeah, I think um, it's it's getting interesting. More recently, more things are going on on the moon, and I think there's now this new focus. Uh, obviously, these Chinese missions, and with the Artemis program coming up. But other countries are saying we want to get involved in this too. We want to we want to go and explore. We want to have our name uh, thrown about with these lunar explorers, which is exciting, but also is highlighting how difficult it is. And the fact that there were two attempts last year, one by India and one by Israel, and both of them failed, shows how challenging it was back in the sixties for the Soviets and the USA to be doing that back then. When you think of the technology improvements you've had 40 years later, uh, 40 or 50 years later, and and with the failures, that's quite crazy. One of my favorite things of the of more recent times which has happened, um, 
was launched in June 2009, and that was the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And the, the visuals we've got, obviously, which has replaced and remapped the moon, essentially, from, from a, with a higher-definition camera than what was, what was used with the lunar orbiters back in, 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 uh, in the 60s. And, and some of the some of the shots we're getting from that thing, it's still operational. Is ah, uh, they're just they're just breathtaking, aren't they? And the fact that you can you can zoom in on the landing sites and see the tracks of the rovers uh, and things like that, it's 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 wonderful that we're getting that kind of um, almost access to the moon yeah. uh, through through the the re- reconnaissance orbiter. And I like how they've also um, done videos where they've recreated the foot like the landing paths so you can see exactly what the astronauts would have seen back in the apollo days but not just through a small triangular window but in higher de- definition and i find that really interesting um are there any other modern missions emily which uh which you think we've not covered here i just want to add a couple of couple things there have been a few more missions um it, if we were here to really mention all the lunar missions you know go through a, like the the entire list we'd probably be here for several hours and you'd keep all be like okay I'm done we can't listen to 8 yeah. hours but um there've been a couple really good scientific missions concerning the moon uh such as grail which had uh two satellites uh ebb and flow and um that good names yeah i think they were named by students as well so it's it's very cute but um this was basically to map the moon's gravity they they did try to investigate that during Apollo. I think Apollo fifteen had a a sub satellite. You may remember yeah. that that uh, yeah, Al yeah, Warden yeah. actually deployed it. I think he was the first person to deploy a satellite. Basically, the the purpose of that was to you know um, investigate the moon's gravitational fields and um, mass cons, which are kind of areas of mass concentration of gravity. They were really trying to investigate, you know, okay, why is gravity stronger in some place and places and not in others? You know, that's kind of weird. So yeah, Grail uh, also investigated that phenomenon and it, it did have a camera. It took some really cool pictures as well. And there's another mission called uh, LADEE or L-A-D-E-E and the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer which kind of explains itself, uh, really. Um, and that I think that one happened in 2013 to 14. I, I, I think, and yeah, Grail and uh, Laddie both ended. I think they all okay. impacted on the moon at some point. But uh, those are really neat scientific missions that um, people tend to see it as, you know, kind of this inert wasteland and stuff. But people are really still trying to investigate it and to learn more about, okay, how what does this tell us about our existence you know what is this yeah you know what is its geology what is its structure you know uh, there's still a lot to be explored about the moon i mean yeah we we have gone to the moon and people have gone to the moon but um we haven't figured out everything about it yet we only went a few times <laughs> <laughs> yeah ex- exactly um it certainly is beginning to feel like the new frontier again uh, the moon that is and uh with modern technology and understanding of what we can do up there it's actually finally beginning to 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 start um making sense to go back and explore um so i think we've got some good lunar times coming up yeah i think the moon is having a renaissance yeah in the 60s we were going to the moon because it was a target for us. You know, we were trying to do it first, you know, and we yeah. wanted to beat the Russians basically. And, um, science was not really a focus of Apollo. Um, even though the three last missions were quote scientific missions, um, really the, the object of Apollo initially was we would, we want boot prints on the moon. Yeah. And I think now it'll be, um, it'll be really useful, you know, to have, more of a, you know, kind of look through a different lens at the moon and try to say, oh, see, you know, how did these processes happen? What can we find out about it that can contribute to our knowledge of the Earth, you know, or any other solar system object? So I think that'll that'll be interesting, you know, and I think it'll be kind of nice to look back at it and not think, you know, okay, we just had to get there to fulfill, you know, a, a, a race. <laughs> you know? yeah. Now we can... You know, now we can look at it as non-competitive and we can go back and ex- actually, you know, really explore it, you know. I, I, we've mentioned this a few times, but the fact that, that it was 50 years ago 
Yeah, that's a long time. That's a big chunk of time. Yeah, and there's 7 billion people on the planet now, and a vast chunk of them uh, have never been alive when there have been people walking on the moon. And isn't that just really exciting that we're getting to a point where that may happen again? Like, it's not just, oh, there's the remains of missions, previous missions, but actually to have people walking around on there right now and, and living on there potentially is just mind-blowing and that could happen in our lifetime. And that's crazy. Yeah, I would like to see crazy. that during my lifetime and our lifetime just because yeah. I came pretty... Uh, pretty close to going? Me too. <laughs> I, yeah, I, uh, I was born in 78, so I feel like I just missed that whole chunk of time. And it's like, yeah. it's crazy because I was thinking about this today. I have a lot of friends who were born during Apollo, but they don't remember it, you know, or they remember very little of it. And they're like, well, I don't yeah. know much. I remember a little bit, but not a lot, you know, and it's like, it'll be kind of neat for them to see it as well, because they'll be seeing it maybe through new eyes, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, and with the modern cameras and communications, I think it's going to be a very different experience uh, when it when it happens again. Um, but we do have to remember this is actually really difficult. And that's why the landing, uh, landing of this Chinese craft this week is so exciting. Because landing on the moon hasn't been done that often, even by robots. Uh, we're not talking about hundreds of missions. We're talking about tens of missions. Yeah. And we're talking about doing it more regularly again, but that's going to have its own challenges. And, and looking through and look, finding out about these previous missions and the robotic stuff is useful. It's useful to know how difficult it was. It took Ranger four or five attempts to get there, that there have been all these failures. You look at that list and, it, and they're either green successful or, or blue operational or red, and there are more red than there are anything else. Most of the missions that have gone to the moon have failed. And I think that's a key thing to take away, is that this is hard. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as we know, Apollo, you know, Apollo 13, they didn't make it for other reasons. So that was definitely, you know, uh, although they did make it yeah. home alive. That's all that mattered. But uh, so 13 didn't really explore the moon because, I mean, they orbited it, but they didn't really. They were it was a survival yeah. mission at that point. They weren't trying to do science or anything like that. You think about, you know, how risky the Apollo missions were too. I mean, just like some, you know, 16 yep. almost didn't land, <laughs> you know, cause they were having issues. Yeah. 14 um, didn't almost yeah, land. Exactly. Like you just think about, okay, this, mm. none of this is easy. I don't know. It, I, I've been thinking a lot. I've been reading a lot about interplanetary exploration just because I'm not an astronomy expert at all, but I'm just, I'm, I am interested in it, especially with all the stuff that's happened with Ari Sibo. Um, by the way, Ari Sibo did do observations in the moon ah. uh, for people who are lunar scientists and stuff like that. But I was reading more about like Venus missions uh, this week, which isn't obviously is not the moon. But uh, <laughs> I was reading about it. I was like, there's so few Venus missions. I mean, it's just it's like we're talking in like a handful of missions to choose from. And I was just like, you know, space is just it's yeah. still unexplored to me, like in general, you know. I mean, not just Venus, but like just every place you look and it's like it's not easy to get stuff yeah. to and from there. My goal in life uh, personally, I guess, is to keep the spirit of that alive so we can keep doing those things. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, the moon is more than just the Apollo program. Newsflash. Yes. And, and that's what we've tried exactly. to do in this week's show. So I will post some things of in the show notes. So maybe you'll go away and have a look into some of these things. Uh, I know I've got to go and do a lot more research, that's for sure. But it's quite humbling seeing how many failures there were, though. Oh, yeah. When they're spending that much money and they've got the smartest people in the world working on things and they still go wrong. That's quite humbling. Um, and, and there's a lot you can learn from that. I think with Ranger, I want to say Ranger was uh, run by JPL. Mm. And uh, people were really taking it quite personally when that kept failing because, you know, it was the 60s. President Kennedy had announced, hey, we have to go to the moon, you know, and um, it was really a depressing time when, you know, Ranger just kept failing and failing and failing. And, fa yeah, <laughs> you know, it was very emotionally difficult for everybody because it was like, if we can't do this comparatively I wouldn't say simple, but if we can't just send a spacecraft to the moon to impact it, you know, what the heck? How are we going to get guys yeah. to the moon? And, 
you just land exactly <laughs> but you think yeah. though within 10 years they did it so they did it they did yeah. it and uh, yeah it just goes to show anyway uh let's wrap this bit up holy crap it's beautiful out here it still is it's something else that's all we've got time for this week and we hope we have uh, opened your eyes to robotic moon missions. Uh, yeah, I definitely opened my eyes to them. So that's always good. And thanks again to all those who continue to support the podcast, uh, whether that's on Patreon or with merchandise or donations. It is much appreciated. Uh, we've actually put up a little bonus mini episodes on Patreon this week, um, which we hope our Patreon subscribers will enjoy. Um, go over to patreon.com forward slash space and things to to get involved yes and uh and by the way thank you so much uh, for the people who've actually uh, tried to promote our patreon uh we really appreciate it we've had a yeah. few people uh, out there you know plug us and it's much much appreciated so thank you so much um also thanks to everyone for tuning in and pressing that share button but remember in space no one can hear you stream Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.